Has anybody ever read Speed of Trust? What's it talk about? There, there's a little analogy. There's three things. Trust is based off of two important factors. If you have trust, it says, it says what? Does anybody remember? Cost. If you have trust, cost to do business does what? It goes down, right? And what does speed do if you have trust? Speed of doing business goes up, right? So if you got trust, cost of doing business goes down, speed to get things, get, get things accomplished is a lot faster, okay? What happens if you don't have trust? Costs go up, so cost to do business goes up, and speed, what happens to it? It goes down. Okay, and it gave a perfect example of 9-11. What happened after 9-11 to airport travel? Did we have trust? Any trust in the airline system or? No, we didn't, right? How long did it take you to go through security after 9-11? Took a long time, did it not? Okay. So, you know, I bring that up because I thought Michelle made a great point. All of us are in this room. Um, Aqua Yield is a young company, and we're trying to build trust, and we need you guys to do that. We need you guys to help us do that. And when we build trust, okay, cost to do business goes down, and things happen a lot faster, right? So uh, we're going to need you guys to help us with that, and I think it's imperative. The message and the takeaway today is how do we build that trust with you guys as individuals to showcase what nanotechnology is and how it can help benefit. We've all been in, the, in a room when we're talking or being, being called snake oil, have we not? And it sucks. It sucks. And the only way to discredit that is to do what? Just to prove yourself. Okay, so we're here today to prove ourselves. We want to get product in your guys' hands, let you guys play with it for those of you who are new to the technology and help you understand how it can truly benefit growers and help them yield more, okay? So I just want to give a little bit of background on myself. Clark mentioned it today, obviously. Uh, I'm the VP of sales for US and Canada. Uh, I've only been working with Aqua Yield here now for about three months. Uh, formerly, I was the sales manager, VP of sales for the ag and turf and ornamental for Redox. Uh, several of you guys carry the Redox line and, and sell that as well. Redox, if you're not familiar, <coughs> it's a company based out of Burley, Idaho. Um, it's a carbon-based fertility line that focuses on delivery of plant nutrients to the plant in a more efficient manner. So um, I've been with, or I was with them for about nine and a half years before I joined Aqua Yield three months ago. Um, I'm married to an amazing woman named Amber, and I'll get into that in a second. I have a son named Jace, who's a freshman at Boise State right now, and a daughter that's a senior in high school here in Utah. Um, I graduated from BYU in international business. Um, I was not an ag major. Um, at the time, to be an international business major, you had to major in a foreign language and have a minor in business, so that's what I pursued and did thinking that I wanted to do business internationally. Uh, and first and foremost, you'll, most of you know this about me who know me, I'm a basketball junkie. Uh, played college basketball. This is the next slide here. This is me pretending like I made a shot a long time ago in Italy. I played in uh, Italy for 12 years after I finished up at BYU. My wife is actually the new BYU head women's basketball coach, uh, but they'll get better. Uh, and this is my son. He's a freshman at Boise State playing right now and uh, just get, got back off a, a mission to Finland for our church. Um, and he's, he's playing right now. You'll probably see him this weekend playing. Uh, they're headed to a tournament out in South Carolina. And this is my daughter. She's the best athlete in the family. I'm just going to be honest. Okay. Uh, and she originally committed to go play basketball at the University of Oregon. And when mom got the job, she's like, screw that, I'm following mom, I'm gonna go play for mom. So she'll be at BYU uh, here next year. All right? So 
This is how it all got started. Okay, I want to go through this just a little bit, give a little background on things. When I retired from playing basketball in, in Italy for 12 years, my knees were shot, couldn't do it anymore. Uh, I actually was contacted by Redox. I was friends with the owner of the company and he asked me to come in and help him uh, build a sales team. And, and I told him, I was like, look, I don't, you know, I, I'm from Boise. I grew up in agriculture. My grandpa was a rancher, but I'm really not an ag guy. I didn't study that. And he's like, no, I, I just want you to come and help us build a sales team for the company. And the first thing that he did was ask me to learn the products from the ground up though. So Bracken, you guys will remember these days. Uh, first thing he did was ask me to sell into sod and to kind of learn the product line from the ground up. And uh, one of the first guys I run into was my good friend Warren down at Biograph. And I'm not sure if I got the dates right. I know the, the trial was right July 4th through September 29th. But I can't remember if it was 13 or 14 or where we were at at that point. Was it 14? Okay. Um, so I started selling into Sod to learn the, learn the product line and to get to know uh, everything that we were doing, the agronomics, the function of the products. And I come across Warren and we started applying redox onto his Sod farm um, to see if we could do something a little bit better, block a little bit faster. And uh, we played with things for about a year and we were having some pretty good, pretty good success. And then along comes this nano technology and I think we were the first we might have been the first ones to play with it at the time right and he had it out there in totes and um, you know the farm manager Flavio was there and we were working on a regular basis and he kept saying to me Trent I'm not I'm not quite sure how we're going to apply this nano you know and and so it, it kind of piqued my interest and we ended up doing a test plot where we were doing redox on, I think it was a 33 acre pivot, was it not? And so what we did is we split the pivot and we did part of it in redox and then we did the rest in redox and nano. And this was the trial. Flavio planted this sod on July 4th and on September 9th he, he cut that. And obviously this isn't something we'd probably put on a pallet and sell immediately. But if you've held one of these rolls of sod, which is what, maybe 80 pounds, roughly, on its end, for it to hold, hold together without any netting for a cool season variety is pretty impressive. So when I saw that, obviously I didn't want to tell everybody about Nano because I was selling Redox. But I, was, I, I saw really good things and I knew it was something that had some merit and it was something that we needed to look into a little bit further. And Warren and I, and, Clark, we've been family friends for a long time, ever since that. So, I want to talk just briefly today on, on uh, the economics of agriculture and where we're headed here, where we've been, where we're headed, and what we can anticipate moving forward. So, who can tell me, who can answer this first question for me? What's the current global population that ag feeds? How much? Seven billions? Eight billion? Over eight? Seven point nine eight billion, right? Is that am I right on that? Google told me that, so. Okay. All right. What's the anticipated population by twenty fifty? Anybody know? Ten? Any other takers? That's close enough. It is spot on. Uh, where's my guy Josh at? I'm right here. Josh, give the guy some money. He hit it spot on. <laughs> right there, 10, mil 10 billion. Okay. Yep. He got it. All right, so now everybody's going to speak up because they know cash is being passed out. <laughs> okay. Question number three, how many farmable acres did we have in the U.S. in 2000? Who can answer that question? Any guess? I was actually really shocked. 
170 million acres. Nope, not in the U.S. Higher than 350. This one, this one shocked me. This one actually really shocked me. 945,000 acres, farmable acres in the U.S. in 2000. I'm just telling you what Google told me. Here's the point of it. What's happening to our farmable acres? What? Speak up. Josh, give the guy some money. You're right. You're right. I, I'm wrong on this, but let's let's amuse myself and say that I'm right. Okay. You're right. <laughs> What's happening, what's happening to our farmable acres? Why? What are the factors? Population, houses, what else? Water. Who has water issues right now? Okay, where at? Where, where are we struggling with water? California? Arizona, Idaho? Texas? Where's Thad at? Where's Thad? I gave Thad a ride. We drove past Jordan L out here on the way in, right? Yeah. What was the water level like? 20 feet below. 20 feet below, right? Okay, so we're, we're struggling in a lot of different areas. Um, but our farmable acres are going down because of a lot of different reasons. And so I guess my question is, how does that impact you guys directly? Think about the first question. What was the first question? We talked about the, po the population, right? We're eight, let's call it eight billion people. We gotta feed 10 by the year 2050, but our acreage is going down. How's that gonna, how's that gonna pan out for us? Huh? Gonna work? Okay. So those are some things that I wanna think about as you guys navigate this. How can nano benefit you guys how can Aqua Yield help you guys do more with less farmable acres that are coming up and we gotta feed more people, okay? So in order to do that, we're gonna have to have better technology. Uh, I can't remember who it was. Was it, was it you guys, JMC, last night you told me? I can't remember, somebody said to me, um, they ask growers the question all the time, do you still drive the 1972 farm or uh, John Deere tractor? You don't, do you? Right, it was you, yep. Okay, we've got to do better with our resources that we have available. We can't just stay in the 50-year-old technology or we're not going to be able to accomplish uh, feeding 10 billion people, right? Okay, let's go through a couple of a couple other facts about pre-COVID. This is a national average diesel Pre-COVID 2019 in September was national average at $3 per gallon. Sound about right? Okay. Cost of 10340, 310. Sound about right? What was DAP? 295. What was MAP? Anybody know? What was it? 320. In September. So it could have fluctuated just a little bit, right? Pretty dang close. What was labor like? <laughs> Did we have labor, labor issues? No, we didn't. Okay. Freight, was it a problem? No problem, right? Okay, let's talk about during COVID. This is 2020, 21, and 22 cost of diesel on a national average. And in some places, went over seven, didn't it? In 2022. Okay, so just kept going up. This is what 1034.0 did. 2020, 2021, 2022. That. 
325, 760, 770. Map, pretty much the same. Labor, anybody have problems with labor? Everybody, right? And what happened to our freight? It's impossible. How long does it take you to get, how long does it take you to get stuff nowadays compared to pre-COVID? Couple extra days. Sometimes that makes a big difference, does it not? If you think about just freight alone, What's that, what kind of burden does that put on you guys as suppliers? Bracken, what does that do to you guys? You gotta forecast a little bit better? If you don't forecast, what happens? Not gonna have the product, not gonna get the sale, right? Competition down the road. So I just wanna think about all those things. So what lies ahead for us in 2023? What do you think diesel's gonna do? with all these electric cars coming out. Gonna go down? Probably gonna go up still, right? It's not, gonna, it's not gonna go down for sure. So it's pretty volatile. What's the cost of fertilizer gonna do? It's kinda stabilized to some degree, but it, it probably is gonna rise a little bit. Um, I won't name names, but I did notice during, uh, well, at least even last year, a lot of manufacturers, when their raw material costs were going through the roof, did they pass all that on to the retailers and the wholesalers? No, I can name a few that I, I'm aware of that did not do that. They ate some of that margin because they didn't want to have everybody have sticker shock, right? How long are they going to hold on to not making that margin? I already know it's coming this year, whether prices of fertilizer, raw materials go up or not, they're gonna pass that margin on and raise a price because they ate it last year, right? Okay, so it's volatile whether raw materials goes up or not. What's labor gonna do? Go up? Okay, gonna go up. Are we gonna have the availability of workers? It's becoming a fiasco, isn't it? Okay, what's freight gonna do? Getting any better? It's not gonna improve. It takes us forever to get everything, right? We gotta anticipate more time for, it to, for things to arrive. Okay, so I just posted a couple of, this, this was posted right, right here November 11th on green markets. Russia set, uh, to set 23.5% duty on fertilizer exports. That going to impact us? For sure. Okay. This, I wanted to also give the other side of the spectrum. It's kind of gone down since May, has it not? So it's stabilizing, but I wanted to point out whether fertilizer or raw materials go down or not, I think you're going to see an increase in fertilizer price because manufacturers were eating margin last year. Okay. Okay, interest rates. Are homes flying off the market right now? They're not. Starting to slow down. Okay, what's your money done this last year with inflation? Is $100,000 worth $100,000 anymore? At least 7% inflation rate, right? So our, we're, we're worth 7% less. Okay, so I just want to point all these things out, not for doom and gloom, but how can we help you guys? Okay, how can we help you guys? And think about that big picture. We've got to feed more, 2 billion more people by 2050, and our acreage is going down. Okay, a couple things that we feel that we can help you guys with is we can help you differentiate from the next guy down the road. Okay. Um, the beautiful thing about aqua yield and nanotechnology is we really don't have to upset the apple cart. All right, a lot of you have your own in-house lines or you're repping a specific product and to differentiate by adding nanotechnology, it can really set you apart. Improve that delivery method to the plant and be more efficient. So you don't have to really upset 
what you're currently doing or what you're currently offering. We can stretch that budget dollar. Okay, so I know growers are going to be price sensitive right now and making sure that we have that kind of uh, language in our conversations with them is going to go a long way. We can yield more and you can anticipate there's going to be a three to one ROI. Okay, does all this resonate to you guys? This is where the takeaway, this is what I want you guys to take away today. This is how we can help you guys. Okay, so I want to focus, you know, uh, as a sales team and as a company, we've talked about um, highlighting two products and going back to JMC last night, having this conversation. It's really hard to get growers or dealers or whoever you may be talking with to focus on all of these products. It's pretty hard. Okay, studies say that most people can tolerate about three to four products before their attention span falls off and then they don't remember anything about any of the products. So we want to focus on a couple of products, not that we'll say don't sell all of our other products, we're happy if you want to do that. But these two products are really the keystones to being successful, Nano Pro and Nano N Plus. Okay, we're talking about adding Nano Pro to any herbicide or fungicide. Once again, we want a four ounces per acre rate, whatever you're going out at, and we're trying to stretch that budget dollar across more acreage, okay? And Nano N Plus for any nutritionals or biologicals, okay? Same concept, we're, we want to improve the delivery method of those uh, nutrients to the plant to get better, better uptake and to ROI better for the grower. Okay, so just wanted to point out what's the best way that we can incorporate this in. We would love to be a part of any of your in-house lines or anything that you guys are currently doing. Okay, so whether that's us shipping you totes of product and you could incorporate it into your vertical, vertical tanks or if we're shipping two and a half sold in, you know, five gallon cases, um, whichever one works best for you guys, but adding it to your own in-house product lines. All right, another option that I wanted you guys to consider when you're putting together your plans is some of you guys toll manufacture. We could easily ship totes of product or cases, whatever you want, to the toll manufacturer and have you guys, or have them incorporated into those blends that come up under your own lines. Okay, so please consider that. I don't want that to be a deterrent um, if you guys are having products uh, bottled or packaged at another location, that's another option that we could explore with you guys as well. Or you could do like a lot of you guys are doing and just sell the aqua yield labeled products directly uh, based off of whatever your, your market needs are. Okay, so just to summarize, going back to things, we want to be a differentiator for you guys. We, want, we feel like we can add a technology that takes us out of 50 year old technology, improves delivery to the plant, and we can do something better uh, with what you're currently offering. Uh, we can stretch the budget dollar, we can yield more, and we can plan on a three to, three to one ROI. Okay? Thank you guys, appreciate it.